Before we continue, understand this podcast is for adults only and refers to relationships and activities between adults which are voluntary and consensual. If you or anyone you know is being abused, coerced, or violently harassed against, please reach out for help to the appropriate authorities. Episode 3, The Caller Itself. Tao, hello, and welcome. Let's talk callers this week. I'll touch on the callers as described in the books, and I'll go into the types of callers I've locked around women's throats. So this time I'm going to get rather more personal than usual. One important thing to note in the books is that the caller on a slave girl is meant to compliment her beauty, but it's also meant to show who owns her. It's her Kef brand on her left thigh, which explicitly marks her as being a slave. So there are a few different collar designs described in the books. There is the basic strap collar. You could think of this as a very short cylinder. It is worn by slave girls in the more civilized parts of gore, and is described as being worn high and snug, like a choker. This also happens to be my favorite look on a slave girl. There is another type of collar, which has come to be known as a Turian-style collar. This collar is worn by Kajirai belonging to the wagon people and the Tachaks and so on, among others. It is described as a torus, that is a very skinny donut or o-ring shape, and is worn a little bit looser than the city collars, loose enough that a man can reach his fingers in there and still have plenty of room. Think of the city collar as being made by bending steel flat stock, and the Turian style as being made by bending a round steel rod. There are other collars worn by slave girls throughout the various cultures on gore, frequently making use of materials that are more frequently encountered in their local environments. Collars worn by male slaves, particularly in the early books, are described as being very simple and utilitarian, and rather heavy iron bent into shape about the neck comes to mind. Male slaves, especially in the early books, are treated with derision by both the author and Gorian society, though our regular protagonist, Taro, finds himself in bondage more than once over the course of the series. With respect to the collars worn here on Earth, there is a lot of information online about safety, etc. in a BDSM context. The women who wear or who have worn my collars over the years, have had neither the keys, the tools, or the metallurgical skill to remove them safely. Is that playing things a little too close to the edge? I know that nearly every SSC, that's safe, sane, and consensual, and RAC, that's risk-aware consensual kink, guideline, treats collars as either a toy something to be donned and doffed at the beginning and end of playtime, or as a piece of jewelry, an accessory that, however meaningful, is not exactly essential. This is where I'll happily break ranks from the enlightened, responsible, safe SSC and rack people. My girls wear or have worn collars that are secure. This is dangerous, and I'm okay with this amount of danger. I can imagine scenarios in which the collar presents more risk, medical emergencies, allergic reactions. Some asshole could even use it as an easy means to abduct and steal my women. There are downsides. I carry with me the keys to remove these collars, but my slave girls do not. There is a chance that someday we could pay dearly for this. But life has risks, being human, and especially being a man is choosing which risks to abide. 
We are comfortable with this risk. We also drive cars, which is one of the most dangerous activities humans indulge in. I ride a motorcycle, sometimes with a slave girl on the back. Even if you're an extremely conservative rider as I am, and you're doing everything right, there could still be something coming around that next curve that will literally take your head off. I don't think that's a good enough reason to give up rolling on two wheels. And the incredibly small risk of collar-related medical issues, and the occasional inconvenience of dealing with airport security or having to explain things to a masseuse who's working on my girl's neck, is within our risk tolerance. Well, our risk and inconvenience tolerance. Is this the right way of doing things? I'm sure I'll get plenty of pushback, but it's right for me. And in my Norman normative argument, I'll go ahead and own it. Locking solid steel or titanium about a girl's throat is better than buckling a leather collar onto her. I dare even say it's better than putting a ring on her finger, though I do both. My Ichiban Dorechan, which is a Japanese way of saying my number one slave girl, has not had a bare neck in nearly 16 years. I have changed out her collar a few times, and I have always handcuffed her behind her back and had her kneel, or I have locked on the new collar before removing the old one, usually both. I'll relate a cute story from very early in our relationship. You see, I knew she was slave girl material from the moment I saw her, and it didn't take me long to collar her. After a few days or so of wearing this Turian style collar, which was delightfully snug, she asked if she could have a bit of a, of a break. I happily obliged. I handcuffed her, had her kneel, and removed her collar for a while. After a few minutes, I asked her if she'd had enough of a break. She meekly nodded, and I replaced her collar before uncuffing her. It sounds like just a cute little anecdote, but this experience was itself quite profound for her. It made things quite clear that there was a master and a slave girl, and she was quite completely mine, and that the power I held over her was multifaceted, but manifestly physical in that moment. Is this wrong? Is this coercive? Is my wife a kidnap victim? There are arguments, even among practitioners of master-slave type relationships, that the master's hold over a slave is incomplete if he needs to have a physical hold over her in order to gain compliance. Is she really mine if I need to keep her tethered or in a cage? Well, here's the thing. Slave women and I would even posit that most women want to be pressed on all fronts. They want the mental, the verbal, the spiritual, and the physical. A slave girl of mine feels my constant embrace through the steel about her throat, or even through the corrective zap through her behavioral enhancement unit. The currency of the realm for women is not merely currency and the material security that money provides, essential as it is. Nor is it merely affection, consideration, or even arousal. It is all of the above and more. But most of all, it is attention and firmness. A woman of mine knows that I will not yield to her in the same way she knows her collar won't come off. And she finds comfort in the firmness I embody, even when some of that is directed against her. This currency is attention, and any woman of mine has her neck attended to 24-7. I happen to think it's an enriching part of our relationship and dynamic. Again, to stay in the personal theme, this is a rule of mine. Any slave girl of mine will have locked about her throat a snugly fitting metal collar that is beyond her power to remove. Is this safe, sane, and consensual? Maybe not. It is, though, most definitely Gorian, and Gorian is good enough for me. What do you think? For those of you who practice a Gorian lifestyle, is locked metal essential? For those of you who are possibly interested in doing so, do you think you would make that a rule of yours? There is a favorite quote of mine from the books, which from time to time I recite and enact with a woman of mine. It's from book 
13, I, yeah, Explorers of Gore. It takes the form of a sort of catechism where a master is uh, going over something with the slave girl and she's needing to repeat by rote certain, you know, principles. The dialogue is like this. He says, what is the common purpose of a collar? The collar has four common purposes, master, she said. First, it visibly designates me as a slave, as a brand might not, should it be covered by clothing. Second, it impresses my slavery upon me. Third, it identifies me to my master. Fourthly, uh, fourthly, fourthly, he asked. Uh, fourthly, she said, it makes it easier to leash me. So this passage appears in the 13th book called Explorers of Gore. But I may have read something similar in another earlier book. I can't quite remember. It's a cute little break from the philosophizing and soliloquizing and sermonizing and mesmerizing that allows for some mirth and a purely practical concern. Of course it's nice to leash up your girl. To again bring things around to the personal. A couple of the women that I have collared over the years in the wild, that is, without the benefit of a BDSM-themed community or personal site as a backdrop for our introduction, have noticed a collar on a girl of mine. Let's just say that I noticed that they noticed. With respect to the physical collar, I think I've made it pretty clear what I consider a Gorian collar and what I don't. The books do refer to a lock having a pin for every letter in the word Kajira. As someone who has been building, modifying, picking, maintaining, rekeying, and installing locks for decades, I can assure you that six pins does sound a little bulky, but it was certainly past muster with me on the security front. The first collar I wrapped around a girl's neck was a homemade monstrosity that made the contraptions from the Saw film franchise look like Tiffany's fine jewelry, but the point was made by my teenage self. My girlfriend at the time was extremely fond of this piece of neckwear and wanted to wear it everywhere. After a while, I was a little embarrassed at how unergonomic it was, so I insisted on removing it from her while I modified it. Back then, as a lad, I didn't have proper handcuffs, so I had to practice a little shibari to maintain my no-free-hands-and-naked-neck protocol. I could talk collars all day, so we'll definitely get into this topic again in a later episode. There are a few well-known makers of collars, you know, here on planet Earth, who deserve special mention. So one is called Eternity Collars. They make Turian-style collars, and I believe they even used to advertise them as Turian-style. They are extremely popular, to the point where many people refer to any Turian-style of collar as an Eternity-style collar. Unfortunately, this also means that knockoffs and imitators are selling Eternity collars made overseas among their products. 2. SM Factory. That's SM Factory. This is a German shop which makes some Turian collars, but whose flagship product is called the Heaven's Hell collar and is a cylindrical collar. It's a little heavy for 24 7 wear, but do what thou wilt with your slave girl's neck. Again, the distinctive design, with its charmingly integrated padlock body, has been copied by overseas manufacturers, and now budget toy sites offer knockoffs of this style. Unlike the Eternity collars, the difference in quality, fit, materials, and finish between the true SM Factory collars and the overseas knockoffs is quite stark. While I don't recommend putting anything cheap against the skin of someone you own and love, I must doubly reinforce this in the case of the Heaven's Hell knockoffs. It's a sad state of affairs, but if you want to practice your Mandarin, just remember that R&D is pronounced rip off and duplicate. So number three, Ring of Steel. Ring of Steel is a small enterprise in the US with a distinctive emphasis on Gorian collars. He makes a few slightly different variations on Turian styles, and I believe he's been making them for a few decades now. He also has some pretty cool photography on his site where he's looking like the Kurgan from Highlander or something. I almost want to buy something of his just to say I own a piece of early Gorian jewelry. I'm not sure if he's still in business. I think he's been going since the 80s. 
I seem to recall that he suffered a substantial personal loss a few years ago. I hope he's okay. Number four, Axmar. That's A-X-S-M-A-R. This is another German shop that makes extremely high quality pieces for premium prices. I have purchased thousands and thousands of dollars from these guys. They should really be paying me a commission at this point. They make a Turian style with an added ergonomic twist called the Telena series and a more conventional band collar called the Hephaestus series. They produce collars out of stainless steel, titanium, and even silver, and the tightness of their hinge joints and latch joints are second to none. I can't recommend Axmar enough. Many of my own collars' designs were originally derivative of Axmar, and I've modified a few Axmar collars in my time to make them more suitable for my purposes. Other than the collars that I make myself, Axmar are my absolute favorite. I spent a small fortune with them and I've never felt ripped off. Of course, like the other German shop, SM Factory, Axmar also produces other items. They produce uh, anklets and cuffs and various types of nose rings, etc. And number five, I'm sure I'll butcher the German pronunciation, but as long as it sounds foreign, as long as it sounds foreign, I guess that'll be fine. Trauma aus Edelstahl. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that quite right. But I have notes in the description with the proper spelling of their website. They make absolutely gorgeous collars as well, though I'm not a huge fan of some of their multiple material pieces. Number six, Neo Steel, My Steel, and Tolly Boy and Fancy Steel are all chastity belt manufacturers. Neo Steel and My Steel have their own proprietary locking system, which they also employ on their collars. It's not a look I really go for, it's a little severe, but the Germans like the real severe stuff. Number seven, Rigid Cuff, which I think used to be called Martin's Rigid Cuff. They certainly popularized the modern take on the Shrew's Fiddle, a favorite bondage device of mine, and they also make some rather chunky collars. But I think they mostly work in aluminum, and I wouldn't put aluminum against my slave girl's necks for long. Number eight. There are a few other players in the collar game. There's a few new guys. There's an enterprise called uh, Swedish Collar. It's putting out some pretty solid pieces of hardware with a unique proprietary locking mechanism. It's pretty cool. Last but not least, number nine. The Treven Forge. The Treven Forge is my own little workshop. I'm producing collars with very unique features. Physically, I'd like to think my collars are on the same level of, as Axmar and SM Factory, but mine have a few tricks up their sleeves. There's nothing like it on Earth. I also produce accessories to grant these features to Axmar, to Lena, and Axmar Hephaestus, and SM Factory Heaven's Hell, and Eternity Collars. And my accessories will even work on the various cheap knockoff collars. The Treven Forge is named for my favorite Gorian city, Treve, or Treve. I don't know how you pronounce it, and I don't really care. The point is, I'm making collars with severely beautiful craftsmanship, and if you'd like to put one around your slave girl's neck, let's talk. Every Treven Forge collar is a very limited run, but I hang on to all the necessary files and jigs to produce spare parts or slightly different sizes for you in case one of your slave girls will bear you children and her neck grows a little while she's pregnant. Indeed, my mission with both the Treven Forge and this podcast is to get more collars around more girls' throats, and to do so, making the world a more beautiful, graceful, and elegant place. I can also cook up some matching bracelets and anklets. I believe every woman deserves a matching set. Now, I promise you, in a later episode, I'll indulge in some seriously shameless self-promotion. But for now, if you can find me, I'll make one for you. Just be ready to part with some coin. And if you want a discount, you'll be parting with some crypto. Tune in next week. We're going to go a little deeper into tribes, groups, acceptance as a virtual vice, and the very concept of identity. We'll ruffle a few feathers most enthusiastic proselytizer of gore such as myself will be the first to tell you gore isn't for everybody and my gore is for fewer still.